Well, uh, it is a privilege this morning to uh, get right into the Word of God, so I'm going to do that. If you want to follow along, it's actually uh, a few chapters that I'm referencing, and uh, I'll bring out some scriptures that I just want you to uh, be aware of. We're talking from the life of David, and I've been trying uh, through the uh, basically book of First Samuel thus far to give you some insight from the life of David, and we've talked about how God chooses people differently than we do, and uh, He doesn't always look at circumstances the way we look at circumstances, and I think of the life of David in particular, and uh, a story when I was younger in ministry, I was a youth pastor, and uh, one, of the st- one of my staff was talking to my wife about uh, some decisions and stuff that I had to make, and uh, particularly he was inquiring on why I didn't trust or lean on him more, and he, she, he said to her, doesn't he know my pedigree? And uh, <laughs> I, I crack up over that stuff because God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I don't think he was by any stretch being arrogant or anything like that. I just think he was trying to express that he came up kind of knowing the Lord under some, uh, I think, some great ministers of the gospel. But God doesn't look at it the way we do. And remember, all of uh, David's brothers, one by one, were brought in, fr- brought in front of Samuel. Very first one, Eliab, he thought, surely this is God's man. And uh, God said, nope. And uh, said to Samuel, I don't look at it the way you do. Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. So in particular, we as believers should spend more time focused on the inward man when we're looking at uh, ser- servants of the, of the Lord. It's not about stature. Although it's nice to have a six foot four frame, the Lord didn't call me because I was tall and he didn't call me because I was an athlete at the time. He called me because he saw something inside of me and I believe that's the same with any servant of the Lord. He looks at the heart and he knows what that person will do. And uh, so in the life uh, of David, we have explored a lot of different things about David. And uh, uh, this issue today is a little more complex because uh, we find about almost a year and a half of David's life uh, predating him becoming uh, uh, coronated as king Uh, that it seems like David is not really with God. And uh, I I think it has something to do with David growing weary from being in the wilderness and being chased down like a criminal. It seems like every time he has a breakthrough with Saul, he he could have killed Saul a couple of times and he didn't, and he refused to touch the Lord's anointed. He refused to uh, usurp and take the throne. I mean, God had already given him the throne. It just wasn't a present reality yet. It was already in the spiritual given to David. God had anointed him. And I, I think to some degree, there's a preparation process. We talked about this in particular last week. God separates and then he prepares before he promotes. And I think from what I, what I can tell, this is, this is, some of it is my conjecture because I, I've looked at, you know, commentaries galore and a lot of them actually talk about this, this appears to be a backslidden David for about an 18 month period. You don't see really inter, interaction with him and the Lord until the end of this period of time. So, uh, I, I started off my message in preparing, uh, talking about how the mighty have fallen. And uh, Saul is in a really bad place. So we, we, we talk about, by contrasting David and Saul, how uh, uh, Saul is man's chosen king and, and David is God's chosen king. And uh, Saul, it seems like he's spiraling down. And sometimes it seems more rapid than others. But now he's, he's in the end of his life because we know 
from reading the scriptures that he's about to die. And uh, he's facing the Philistines on the battlefield. And in the process of doing that, he takes a little detour to consult a spiritist, a medium, so to speak. And uh, he, he goes in disguise, and uh, a lot of the commentators said because he was close to the, to the line of, of battle, he had to disguise himself as to keep himself from being seen by the enemy. And also, he had already put out an edict that all spiritists and mediums were to be uh, kicked out of, and it was a capital offense to consult spirits. And uh, so David, or uh, Saul, is, is going under disguise because he wants to speak to Samuel, who is now deceased. Samuel had died. And, and if you read the scripture, sometimes you think, my goodness, what is this all about? And uh, again, this is another one of those debated issues on what exactly is going on in this instance. And some uh, say that this is uh, a, a demon that's working through this woman. I believe this woman was a charlatan. I believe she was shocked that, that Samuel came, represented uh, uh, God's voice in the life of Saul in this moment. God will sometimes do uncommon things. We don't see a repeated uh, uh, pattern here. This isn't the way that God communicates with us. He talks directly to us, but it's very clear from the Bible that at this point in time, God wasn't talking to Saul anymore. He did, he, the priest, the prophets, none of these things, the word of God was not uh, evident to Saul anymore, and he was scared out of his mind. So he consults this medium so that he can speak to Samuel. And the Bible's very clear that Samuel came, and this woman was even shocked that Samuel came. I think that probably speaks to maybe she was a little more charlatan, and maybe there was a little more demonic stuff going on, so this, this holy man coming scared the daylights out of her. And uh, so uh, Samuel gets a little hot with Saul. Like, what did you call me up for? I'm just, it's a little bit odd to me, but I, I'm reading it this way, and this is the way it's written. And uh, so uh, he asks Saul directly, what am I, why am I here? And he goes into detail. He's like, listen, I'm scared that the Philistines are here, and I'm not hearing anything from God. <laughs> and you ought not think that, that you can... You can continually disobey God and continually uh, uh, walk away from the word that he has spoken, continually disobey, continually keep going down a pathway, and that God is just going to be like, oh, poor little Chris or poor little you. I know it's not common language today. I know most people will tell you, oh, it doesn't matter. God will never leave you nor forsake you. But it's clear from the word of God from beginning to end that there are times where God will go silent. And most of the time when you see God go silent, it's as a result of disobedience. People continue to disobey him. And if, if, if you're going to disobey his will that he's made known to you, you ought not think that he's going to continue to tell you something new because you don't want to do what he's already explained to you. And this is where we find Saul. But Samuel says, hey, your, your, your kingdom is doomed. And, and there's a neighbor, and he gets direct, David is going to replace you. This is tough news. And so he goes ultimately to battle with the Philistines and he ends up falling on his own sword and taking his life. But this is all going down as a, a parallel track to what's going on in David's life. So I told you last week about how it seems as though David, to some degree, has lost all self-respect. I mean, we find him in front of uh, an enemy king, uh, you know, drooling out of his mouth, acting like a madman because uh, he recognizes that his life could be in danger in this moment. But I, I just want to be very clear about this. Whenever God anoints you for a purpose, 
Whenever God anoints you for a purpose, you, he will fulfill that purpose in your life. And your disobedience at times might slow down the process, but God's going to fulfill his purpose. And there are times we've seen in Scripture where, uh, like Moses, didn't really get into the promised land. He made him promise to take his, uh, take his bones with him, but he, he was held out of the promised land because uh, of, of his lack of trust in God in a couple of situations. So I, I want to say to you, I, I just think that uh, there are situations in the Bible where the, the promise wasn't realized in their lifetime, but God always fulfills his purpose. Always. His will will be done. And even Jesus, when he was struggling at the depth of the, of, of the will of God for his life, was like, God, if it's possible. But he said, Never, nonetheless, not what I will. I want your will to be done, not only in my life, but in this whole situation. Ultimately, he bore the penalty of sin upon his back and in his body as he hung on the cross. So David is... Uh, living in the desert at our last uh, time we talked, and now he does something that I can't find anywhere where this is like God instructing him. He, he almost is to get some peace in his life. He, remember, he's living in caves. He's being chased around like a wild animal, and uh, it just seems like Saul uh, relents for a moment, and then he's back at it again, relents for a moment, back at it again. Every time he makes a promise, he ends up uh, going back to it. It just shows you how this, he's unstable. A double-minded man is unstable in all he does. So Saul is making life miserable for David. And David decides to go and, in essence, he submits to a, a, a Philistine king. This is problematic because this is ultimately who God has called David to free the Israelites from. They're, they're, God's, they're the people's biggest enemy at this point, the Philistines. They're surrounded by them. Remember when they were given the, the command to go in and, and possess the promised land, this is one of the things that, that God told them they were going to face. They were going to face the, the, these uh, enemies of God. Ultimately, the Philistines were to be removed from the land. And now, uh, David is in a season that I, I, I didn't really, I think, focus on it like this before. I, I would ultimately put probably his greatest struggle and failure we would have put uh, with uh, Bathsheba later on in his actual reign as king, but I think something is formed in him in this time that ultimately uh, it, it, the seed is harvested way down the road when he does uh, uh, sin with Bathsheba. So uh, David goes to King Achish. It, like you, like I, I, I listened to it in Hebrew so many times. It's like you got to get into that back of your throat and just almost like you're hawking up a loogie almost. Like a kish. And uh, he goes to him and he, he, he basically comes under him as king and, and he begins to do stuff that is not really for a man of God ultimately to do. Uh, he's the anointed king and he starts... Uh, you know, helping Akish, and they go uh, out on raids. It literally means to strip. They're, they're stripping uh, the, the, the villages they go into, and David is actually invading Philistine areas, and he's coming back to Akish, and he's telling Akish that he actually uh, invaded uh, parts of Judah, and he was actually taking care of the Israelites. And uh, David is lying. And by the way, in this situation, he's not leaving anybody alive to go back and tell Akish that, that he's actually doing what he's doing. Nowhere in here does it say he's honoring God. Nowhere in here does it say that God told him to actually do what he's doing. He's just doing it. And then it gets to the, to the height of this period of time, uh, almost a year and a half in, uh, Akish tells him, we're going to fight the Israelites. Come with me. And David agrees. It 
Some, some try to kind of, kind of give it a little uh, twist or turn or in the plot, like David was actually acting the whole time. In fact, he doesn't really say to him, okay, I'm, I'm going to do whatever you ask me. I'm going to take out the Israelites. It doesn't say he's not, but it doesn't say he is. He seems a little coy with his responses and his answers. Okay, now you're really going to see what I'm capable of. Uh, uh, you know, I've been, uh, and, and Akish actually says, you're going to be my personal bodyguard. You're going to protect me. Weird stuff from the man that God has anointed and raised up and, and told him, you're going to actually uh, deliver the people and you're going to take care of the Philistines. This is kind of weird behavior. And I don't pretend to understand at all. I'm just telling you that to me, it seems like David has slipped a little bit in his responsibilities. Maybe uh, uh, just time and and aggravation and being chased around did something inside of David. Maybe he wanted to repeat. We might look at it and say, man, this just seems to be the right thing to do. And sometimes we get into situations like this where we get weary in the battle, we get weary in the journey, and we just rather have a, a, a moment of peace away from all of that. And we do things, we make decisions, we didn't consult God, and we find ourselves in a situation that ends up being a, a problem for us. And I know in a a kind of a a, a weird situation, God is sovereign. He's over all of this. So God uses this situation to turn David back to him and and to consult him. But remember, a year and a half. I mean, it's a year and four months, but that's close close to a year and a half. So he's he's, uh, struggling now with with what's going on in his life. And uh, he's getting ready to go out to battle, and then uh, Akish says, uh, because all the other rulers of the Philistines said, this is not right, he's going to get out there, and he's going to start fighting, and he's going to turn against us. So you need to send him and his 600 fighting men back home. Send them back to Ziklag, which he gave to David, because David was like, I, I don't, I don't, I think part of it was David was kind of in this moment, he's kind of conniving. He's like, I don't want to be under your rule where you can see what I'm doing and the plans I'm carrying out. So give me a, a community, give me a village that I can take a, as my own. And he sends them to Siklag. And uh, there, there's li- uh, a moment where uh, uh, David is uh, responding to the king like, what did I do to you? Why are you sending me back? And he says, listen, David, I don't see any fault in you. You've been, you've been kind to me. You've, you've protected. You've done everything I've asked you to do. And he says, but I need to send you back because all the rulers want you to go back. So don't cause problems. Just go back to Ziklag. So he and his fighting men uh, return to their, their hometown, and they discover that it's on fire, it's in ruins, and all of their family and all of their, their herds, everything they had, had been looted and they're all gone. And now David is confronted with the reality of the last year and a half. He's confronted with the decisions he made and now uh, uh, he, they're, they're, these men, including David, are weeping so much so that their strength left them. You ever had a loss that affected you that deeply that that you just felt sapped of your strength and maybe it it, it just kind of left you bewildered and you're sitting there going, what is going on? And this is where these men are. This is where David is. So much so that the men get upset with David and they want to stone him. That's tough. I mean, you've, you've sweat, you've shed blood and you've had... You know, blood, sweat, and tears. You've been in the trenches with these. These are your brothers. They're, these are closer than maybe even some family members. And, and David is the leader, and now they want to take him out. And we find David in this peculiar place, and something powerful happens. The Bible says that David gets alone. He asks for the ephod, the priestly ephod, and he, say, he, he inquires of the Lord. In fact, David encourages himself in the Lord. David takes a moment to get refreshed with his Savior, with his God. 
So uh, it just brings me to a few thoughts that I want to give to you today. I'm going to bust through them because just the sake of time, we're going to get through them. And I want you to understand, you got to trust God when you don't understand what's going on. This starts with, with, with David being sent back to Siklag. But you can also see him being sent back is actually God's ultimate provision because if he'd not gone back, who knows how long he would have been and what kind of situation he would have been in. We don't, we don't know because we don't see the progression of him going out to fight against Israel. But I would like to think that David would do exactly what all the Philistine uh, uh, kings were afraid of or rulers were afraid of, that he would turn against them. We'd like to think that he would stand with his people and fight against them. But we don't know because that's, that's not the progression here. He gets sent back. But by getting sent back, he, he actually gets to a place where God can bring him back to his senses and then send him out to get his family and everything else that comes with it. So David is sent, or David is, he's struggling. He's, he's, he's got to get before God, and when you don't know what you should do, when you don't understand what's going on, you got to trust God. Turn your, turn your situation over to Him. Go to God. Ask God for, for information. Help, help me understand, God. Help me get what's going on. It's important. Men, this is important for you. In fact, I felt like the Lord stirred my heart. Men, we have a great responsibility on us, a mantle of leadership in our homes, in our society, and whatever God calls us to, we're, we're instructed by God to lead. This doesn't exclude any of you in the house this morning that are ladies, but I'm just saying to you, in this situation, like, like we need to seek God. We need to seek to understand what's going on. Get God's wisdom. Try to understand what, what's going on. And in this situation, it might mean you need to turn back to God. Maybe you haven't been asking him the questions. Maybe you haven't been seeking him. And now it's time to get back to him. The second thing is we need to trust God when we feel all alone. David is, it seems like everything is against him now. At least when he was being chased around by Saul, he had 600 men who were with him and family that was with him. And, and, and granted, he wasn't ideal. It was in caves. He was in the wilderness. He was just, just kind of going from place to place trying to survive. But at least he had his men and his family with him. Now his family's gone and the men have turned against him. When you're alone, you got to trust God. It's really important when you're alone because that's when the enemy comes and he, bar he, he, he bombards your mind. He did that with Jesus in the desert. Jesus is alone. He's seeking God. He's praying. He's fasting. And what does it say? The, Bi the Bible says the enemy came and began to tempt Jesus. And at the end of the temptation, it says he left him for a more opportune time. The, the enemy's He's an opportunist. He's going to take advantage of situations where, where, where you're susceptible to what he's got to say. And when you're alone, it's easier to get picked off. So David is alone, and, and the, here's the key. He's not alone unto himself. He's alone to hear from God. Sep Sometimes you got to separate yourself from the circumstances and the situations, and you need to get alone before God. Let him speak into your life. I think of this because the Bible actually says that David uh, has written psalms. I, I've, I've gone over many of them with you, but here's just a few more. I, I read 18 to you last week, 18 verse 6a says, In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. And then Psalm 27, verses 1 and 2, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, then, uh, they will stumble and fall. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 6. I'm going to read the first one. It says, it says I will extol the Lord at all times, and uh, his praise will continually be, or always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. We need to turn to the Lord in our struggles. So I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. 
He put a new song in my mouth. This is what happens when we get before the Lord. And, and some of the struggle for us, I think men in our culture, it's, it's hard to be alone. Why? Because when you're alone, everything's exposed. And I want to say this to you. This is an important time to trust God. When you, when, you're, when you feel like everything's against you and everything has got you engulfed, turn to God. And even if you have to repent, even if you have to go to God and say, God, I've blown it. I'm here because of the decisions I made. I didn't consult you. But I, I know that you are a God of mercy and grace. And if I turn back to you, you will hear my cry. You will respond to me. If, if you need encouragement, open up the psalm, Psalms and start reading them. Read what David had to say. There was times where he lamented. There was times where he celebrated. There's times where he lifted his, his voice in high praise to God. I want to say this to you. God is not threatened by what you feel. You have to turn to him and open it up. Say, God, I'm here. And men, this is one of the things that society pushes down on us and bashes us for. And I'm not saying you have to be all, like, all more sensitive. That's not necessarily what I'm getting at. What I'm saying to you is you've got to be able to express yourself to God. Some of you might be muted in your, in your emotions because you've been told your whole life to push it down. But that's not how God is. God's like, let it out, Chris. Let it out. Let it out. David would say things like, God, where are you? My enemies are all around me. Psalmist says, why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your trust in God. Put your hope in him. Like when you get to the place where you're discouraged and down, turn to God, trust God. Third thing the Lord put on my heart is trust God when you don't know what to do. God, they took our families. They took everything. Should I pursue? Sometimes we don't spend enough time asking God what we should do. Or better yet, we're not good at waiting for him to communicate to us what he wants us to do. So we take charge. I'm just going to do something. That's not what God's asking. He's asking you to trust him fully. He's asking you to put yourself in his care and whatever he tells you to do, he's looking for you to put one foot in front of the other and obey. I'm my own boss. I'm the master of my own domain. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible place to be. I don't want to be the master of any domain. I want the King of kings and the Lord of lords to be the master of, my, of, of whatever he's called me to do. I don't want to be in charge of that. I, by the way, I'd mess it up completely. I need him to be in charge. Trust God when you don't know what to do. Why is this important? I believe that discouragement is one of the main killers in people's lives. It snuffs out purpose and destiny. It stuffs out just the fire you have to live a vibrant, spirit-filled life. Discouragement's one of those things where if you let it, it will keep you pinned to the mat. I thank God that David found God's voice in the middle of his maybe darkest time to, to this point. He, he finds God. He doesn't, he doesn't spiral. He doesn't go see. Like he could have went after the idols of the land. He didn't do that. He went to God. God, I need you. You might be fighting with discouragement today. You might be facing the challenge. And why, why does it come? Well, I, I think it's pretty simple. This is just, uh, these are uh, some thoughts that I've written down a while ago. And I just, I, I, I'm going to read them off really quickly. And then I want to go to prayer because I want to ask in particular the men in this place to respond to God today. I felt like that was, God's spirit was speaking to me. Men, I need you to come to me. Respond to me. That doesn't exclude the ladies of the house. You, you, you could respond to God the same way. 
But I would challenge you that probably what you would really enjoy in your life, especially if you got a spouse, a husband, is for him to hear from God. There's been plenty of times in my marriage, my walk with God, where I wasn't going to God like I should, and I probably look like a ping pong ball being tossed all over the place. Or as the Bible says, a double-minded man is unstable in all he does. I wasn't spending time listening to God, and I was being bounced around. Why? Because I wasn't hearing God, so I was just making it up as I went along. Discouragement comes when you're fatigued, you're tired, you're wore out. These guys were wore out. Discouragement comes when you face false reports or lies. There's times where you hear things that just get inside your head and they mess with your head. And you start even believing what the enemy's out there. You know, his marketing department's on full blast and you're sitting here thinking, oh man, that, that's really the way it is. And God's like, nope, it's not. Failure or apparent failure. You might, you might think, be discouraged because you think you failed in some way or form or fashion. And can I tell you again, God looks at things differently than we do. What seems like maybe a failure to you, ultimately God will turn into a victory. How do we know this? Because what he did for David. David, go. You pursue. You're going to get back your families. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're going to plunder the Philistines. They did what God told them to do, and they came back with so much spoils, so much uh, uh, stuff that they were able to provide for all of their families, of the 600 men, including the 200 that got, got dead tired as they were running after the Philistines. Actually, Amalekites. So then he... he he brings it back, and then he sends, he sends gifts to the rulers in Judah. Paving the way, he's repairing relationships, paving the way for him to be raised up as king. What looks like failure, God can turn and use it for his glory. Don't get so discouraged that you give up on God. Frustration, when things aren't going the way you think, you get discouraged. And fear, fear's a big motivator. Can I just ask you to do something? I know it's, it's 17 after, I, I get it. I just felt like the Lord put on my heart that if you felt the sting, whether, whether, whether in obedience to God you have faced discouragement, you faced struggles, by the way, if you're doing anything for God, you're going to have opposition from the enemy primarily. But I would say the enemy is a big struggle when you're serving God and honoring God. He'll put stuff in your way to discourage you. He don't want you to succeed. He wants you to fail. He wants you to fall short. Could you imagine if, if he somehow stung David so deeply that that he rejected God's plan and ran away from God altogether. The rest is history. We know that Jesus comes from the line of David and then ultimately establishes that throne forever. And Jesus, by the way, is, is, he rewards his people with gifts. I was thinking of what it says in Ephesians. Chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. David was showing us what Jesus would ultimately do for us. He comes away from Ziglag with a great prosperity, and he spreads it around. And Jesus has been doing that for his church For two millennia, he's been handing out gifts. Man, I want you to know, God has called us to lead. And if you're discouraged today, he wants to to lift your spirits. He wants to show you that he hasn't abandoned you. He's got a plan for you. He's not rejected you. I wonder if there's anybody in here who feels that this morning. You're struggling, and God... God wants to touch your life today. 
Can, can everybody just bow your heads for a minute? And I'm just going to ask you, if you're in this place, I'm going to ask you to do something really bold. And you're a man, and you're like, man, this I, I, it identifies me. I, I am the one who's struggling with this. David is a good example this morning of what to do in these circumstances. When I don't know what to do, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to let God lead me. And you're ready Maybe, maybe you've walked away. Maybe you're like David in an 18-month period. You're struggling. You haven't been following or listening to God. You've been leading your own life, making your own decisions. You haven't consulted with God at all. It'd be time to return to Him and say, God, I've been doing this, and it's, it's leading me down fast. I'm discouraged, disheartened. Turn to Him. Or maybe... You're doing exactly what God wants you to do, and you're still discouraged. You're like, God, where are you in the, all this? I, I don't understand. I can't seem to get a breakthrough. God wants to encourage you today. If that describes you, would you just stand to your feet real quick? If you're a man in this place and this is described, you just stand up. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Can I, can I do something just really quickly? If you're uh, sitting, you're a man in this place, you're sitting, I'm assuming you're sitting because you're okay. You think, God, I'm doing fine. I want you just to go stand next to a brother. Maybe two or three on each brother would be fine. Come on, quick, let's do it. We're going to just pray real quick. Father, I thank you for each man in this place. I thank you that when we are feeling discouraged and dismayed or, man, there's no hope, or we just feel a little beat up, we're tired, exhausted, fatigued, we don't know why we feel so discouraged, I pray that we would see this as a moment sent from you to encourage us to let us know that you have you to find real encouragement. That we wouldn't fall for false encouragement that's there in the moment of an emotional experience, but we would walk out of this place knowing in our hearts that we met with God and that He's going he's gonna to do a work. Where there's a struggle for wisdom, I pray you'd bring wisdom. Where there's a struggle, maybe with some secret sin or something that has just kind of beguiled us and kept us away from you. God, we repent of that and we turn to you and ask you to cover us with your precious blood, the blood of Jesus. For your word says, because Jesus shed his blood, there's forgiveness of sin. You separate our sin from us. Lord, I pray today that you would restore our brothers that are struggling, maybe with some sort of sin that, that has just entrapped them. I pray that they would find that you set them free today. For he the Son sets free is free indeed. I pray today that, that you would work on each one of us. I pray your blessing and your touch on us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to work with you more deeply. I pray that you would open yourself with him before you leave today. If you want to find a place of solitude today before you leave and just say, God, would you speak to my heart? Am I struggling with this at all? Let God speak to you, man or woman. It doesn't matter. God wants you to be encouraged. He wants to lift you up. He wants to help you today. And I believe our king is on the throne and he wants to help you through. Whatever you're dealing with, trust him because he's a good God. Amen.